And I've said before them, I said yesterday, we need to get aid into Palestine. I know how we can do it. All the countries, which are powerful countries with big armies, that are giving arms to Israel, they must send their soldiers to the Rafah border to escort the 700 trucks of aid into Gaza. <laughs> that matter is on the BBC now, and they probably think I'm a mad woman, but I'll keep saying it. The lady said to me, Minister, surely you can't expect that to happen. So I said, if the world has a conscience, that's what must happen. It must be them who ensure we don't have dead skeletons on the street of Gaza because people are starving. And she said, will Israel allow it? And I said, will Israel shoot their biggest supporters? It's only them. The supporters of Israel have a big responsibility to address the needs of the people of Gaza. And that's what we should be saying more and more and more. We've sent 2,000 troops to Congo to pr promote peace there. Can we get international troops to go to assist the people of Palestine? It is a thing that is directly and urgently needed. Thank you. I am here to speak on behalf of the Palestinian people all. I am a representative of the Palestinian people. Okay, we represent our people here. No, 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 Palestine. We represent Palestine. No. We, we thank Palestine. Aman la! Aman la! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, Comrades. Lastly, lastly. Come, hold on, hold on, hold on. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about. African politics, economy, and increasing power. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on Africa's geopolitics, economy, and changing landscape. Let's continue now. Honorable Minister, Premier, former ministers, ambassador, brothers and sisters, listeners and viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to start with a question. How is it that in the age of mass media, where generally we know whatever is happening in any part of the world, how is it that in such an age, a genocide continues to take place for over five months. How is it that despite the global outrage, the widespread condemnation, the majority of the citizens of the globe taking to the streets and protesting against this genocide, that it has yet not been stopped? One of the main reasons for this is that the major powers give lip service to committing to the tenets of justice and upholding the tenets of justice. They give lip service to upholding their own agreements, their own treaties, their own resolutions, and their own covenants. As Muslims, we know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, set himself apart, where in his example, we see the lens to which he went to uphold his commitments and to remain true to the treaties that he signed, and that he kept to account the betraying tribes of Makkah and Medina who violated treaties and covenants. We take inspiration from a well-known statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he said that even if my beloved daughter Fatima was to commit a crime, she would be punished like everyone else. And in that, he was highlighting that there's no two standards of justice. There's no one standard for the elite or the powers that be and another standard for the rest. These nations that claim to be the architects of the global system, they are betraying humanity. They are betraying humanity by not upholding the tenets of justice, by not upholding these agreements, covenants, and resolutions. 
They use double speak about upholding the law when it suits them. And then they become vague and evasive when it's conducive or when it serves their own political and economic interests. So this brings me to a point where we have to pay tribute. Justice demands that when we have to be critical of the ruling party and the government in the interest of South Africans, then we do so and we will continue to do so. But justice equally demands that when acknowledgement is due, it must be given in due proportion. <laughs> Minister Pando, on behalf of the Jamiat al-Ulama South Africa, on behalf of the Muslim community, on behalf of every peace-loving and justice-seeking citizen of not only this country and this world, thank you. You, your colleagues in your cabinet, the ruling party, the president, have done not only us South Africans proud, you have shown the world the way at the time when the Palestinians have been betrayed by their own neighborly and brotherly states. History, Allahu Akbar, history, and more importantly, the Almighty will, inshallah, judge you very favorably for this. <laughs> this ICG case is significant. Yes, we know the genocide continues, but the language has started to change even in the capitals of these Western nations that shown unconditional support. It's a start only, but it's an important start. It's an important start. We are not oblivious to the realities of the agendas of the imperial forces, and we know that you have taken this morally courageous stance at great political and economic risk, but you've taken the stance nonetheless. And for that, we have to once again salute you. Our hope is in this, that these nations will continue to dishonor their commitments and to break the law and to violate treaties but they will lose as long as we remain committed to the quest for peace and justice. That's the system of the Almighty, and that is what history shows us time and again. It may take a while, but justice always prevails. Let me say this in conclusion, Honorable Minister, and I want to express the sentiments of the speaker before me. I know there are technicalities, I know there are legalities, but we appeal to our government, we need to fast-track the process now of holding those account to go and fight and contribute militarily or economically via our own banks to this genocide. We need to fast-track holding them legally to account. We need to, we need to look at defective policy like the so-called spy bill, which could open up the doors for legitimate activism for justice to be stifled in the name of the law. Let me say this as I conclude. I know, Honorable Minister, Premier, that we are in election season. And we make an appeal to the ruling party and to the government that lead us in upholding the principles of justice here in South Africa as well. By becoming true servants of the people, by rooting out corruption and incompetence from your own ranks, and by speeding up the process. And by speeding up the process, Honorable Minister, for ensuring a better life for all South Africans 30 years after democracy. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be with you today. I wish to begin by saying to you, I would like you as this audience, made up primarily of South Africans, to be proud of yourselves as South Africans. You have done something incredible. I am not seeking to please you when I say to you the whole world wants to know South Africans. They want to know what does it take to take on this very difficult challenge. As a country that is right at the bottom of the African continent, that is a small economy compared to big economies, 
and that really should not have the cheek to challenge anyone. Now this challenge does not begin today. And so before I speak about the ICJ, Farsiha, with your permission, I just want to say, I thought I was the only speaker here. And so I prepared a whole speech, but I'm putting it aside because Comrade Adam said we must be very brief. And I'm not used to brevity, but I will be. So in terms of uh, what does it mean, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is the highest global court. It is one of the institutions of the United Nations body of institutions, a very significant body because it has the right to adjudicate on a wide range of matters that are set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in international humanitarian conventions and protocols, in a range of instruments that govern international law. And let me make it clear, what we're talking about today is international law. And I should have said, while Naledi is the one who's speaking, the leader on this issue is Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa. And I should say too, the ANC didn't support, didn't start supporting Palestine yesterday. It didn't start when we went to the ICJ. African National Congress has always stood with the people of Palestine in their struggle against oppression and injustice. It's not something new. It's not a new thing. Some people might be discovering it just today, but we have always been in solidarity with the people of Palestine. Some of our freedom fighters were trained by freedom fighters of Fatah and the Palestine Liberation Organization. And so we will not desert Palestine until freedom and their state equal with us. We will continue to support their just cause. This is a very important point. <clears throat> a second point is, as South Africa, in terms of our international policy, we believe in what is called multilateralism. We believe in a multipolar world. We don't believe in unipolarity, that there are one or two powerful governments in the world who think they can tell the rest of us what we should do. We don't support that. In our view, the premier institution of multilateralism, which should oversee our rights and our access to human rights is the United Nations and no other body. So we're very clear on multilateralism and the premier global institution for humanity, the UN. We are against establishing institutions that displace the United Nations. We're against unilateral sanctions by one powerful country against countries of the world without recourse to the United Nations, which should be the one that sets sanctions. So I want to make these things very clear. This is a difficult world we're grappling with. It's a global set of challenges that all of us have to understand and engage with. So we said, as government, we cannot, as South Africa, that came through the struggle against apartheid, tolerate what is being done to the people of Palestine. We had at that time already observed for over a month the murder of children, of women, of old men, of youths, and we said we can't sit silently by. What is available to us? We were one of the first countries in partnership with gift of the givers to send aid through Egypt to the suffering people of Gaza. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
some of our aid got through, but I know a large amount of our aid is still stuck at the Rafa border because Israel is not allowing it in. So we are now going to approach others to ensure that we are able to get that aid in. But we thought, as government, let us test the most challenging international instrument to see whether it would act in terms of our case against Israel. I want to confirm to you the decision to go to the ICJ was taken by the cabinet of the Republic of South Africa. It was a government decision. We had had many, many people indicating government needs to do something, government must act, and in fact, we'd already referred Premier Netanyahu to the ICC for the ICC to actually investigate the conduct of the government of Israel and to do as they did with President Putin and issue a warrant for Prime Minister Netanyahu. We are still waiting for that to happen. But once we presented the memo to our cabinet, the cabinet immediately agreed that we must go to the ICJ in terms of the Convention on the Crime and Punishment of Genocide. So, following the decision of 8th December, we asked everyone in cabinet to say nothing and to leave it to Durko and Justice to do the work first. Because we know, you know, when there are leaks, then it gets to other people and they put all kinds of barriers in your ability to act. So, alhamdulillah, everybody was quiet and never spoke about it. <laughs> I must confess that one day I was in the Boer Cup at a meeting of our Muslim community in the Boer Cup. And there were some ladies who were very revolutionary. I'm sure they are BDS members because BDS is revolutionary. And they were shouting at me, Naledi, action, Naledi, action. And this was after the cabinet meeting. And I knew in my heart that we were preparing, but I couldn't defend the government. I, there was nothing I could say, because I told everybody, let's keep quiet till we're ready. So I took the ladies, they punched a bit and everything, and I just knew in my heart, and I was saying, Allah, I know you're listening, you know what we're preparing. So we worked throughout December. It was our legal team, and especially the DG of Justice and our DG, Zane Dangle, who did the hard work. <laughs> and of course, the initiator was Minister Lamula, and the executioner is me. Uh, so, uh, so we were working throughout December, but the papers are prepared by lawyers because it's a court case. Uh, all I did was they would send something, and I say you missed out and <laughs> you didn't spell this properly, and so on. But. Uh, we, we got the documents done, then we sent them to our principal, the president of the ANC, President Ramaphosa. He took a few days and I was getting worried because there's a deadline, so I kept sending him SMSs. President, we need the document, we've got to finalize it. I have to send it in by such and such date in December. Fortunately, Zain Dango is Muslim and myself, so we could spend December doing that. So we were able to work on it, and 29th of December, on the date of the deadline, we sent it in. Importance is, one, you're approaching a global international institution. Very important. So what does it do? What you table before it is tabled before the world. It's tabled before the world. When we sat there in The Hague, the feeling in my heart was for the first time, Israel's impunity is visible to the world.
So the importance was the issues related to our belief that genocide is being committed. Those issues and what genocide means were on the table described by our legal team. You would have seen with the Israeli legal team, they couldn't respond to those issues. We tabled all the matters, and of course, it's a court case. We don't want to ruin our court case, but here's the process. We had to wait for their decision. We wanted an urgent decision on provisional measures only. Not on the genocide, because you don't deal with it quickly. It's a whole process. But on the provisional measures, we wanted the court to say, stop this killing make sure aid gets in, and all the nine that we asked for. They granted seven of the nine, and we, we feel vindicated, primarily because in Israel's case, its responding case, one, they said they have no dispute with South Africa. We have a dispute with them. <laughs> they said they don't have a dispute, we don't have a dispute, and therefore, in terms of the convention, we cannot bring a case. But we had written to them to say we are going to the ICJ and what the reasons are. And they unfortunately wrote back to us saying they disagree. So there was a dispute. And the court said there's a dispute. You're shaking your head. You disagree. I'm talking facts not making it up. The gentleman is going like this. <laughs> so the second thing was the issue of genocide, because it's a very serious allegation to make. To commit genocide is a very serious matter. And so the court has to consider all the issues extremely carefully. Hence, the final decision is not made immediately. But what the court does, they look at what you have submitted and they make a decision on what they call plausibility. Is it plausible that genocide is indeed underway as South Africa claims? So when we were in the court, the first part of their statement was accepting there's a dispute Third paragraph, and they, you know, they took long, you know, lawyers reading all their things. But when they came to the third paragraph, they then spoke to the matters relevant to genocide and the sections we had quoted of the convention. And they said they find that we'd got dispute, we got plausibility, and the lawyers were breaking my hands by that time <laughs> because they knew that the court was taking our case seriously. So the important, uh, uh, importance of this case is first, you're with a global international body, and when you have a global institution, for all countries, whether they agree with you or not, to reject what that court says places you in a very invidious position. Remember as well that if you are associated with the commitment of genocide, the committing of genocide, you yourself become a party of the guilty parties. This is why you would see that certain leaders are now being sent out, powerful leaders. After telling us we are ridiculous in the public domain, they're now saying Israel must respect the international court. Now, they've changed because next thing you are implicated and you have to come before the court. So that is, in, in sum, that is the importance. Then what, where do we go from here? All we were dealing with in, initially is do we have a case and can we have provisional measures? You know that Israel has ignored the provisional measures. They've submitted the report. That's the only part they've acted on. We are preparing a response to their report. I don't have to tell you what it is. You can guess uh, what's happening there. But the court has reiterated 
that Israel has a legal obligation as a state party to the convention to act on what the court has set out. So the legal points are established. We're now going to move, once the court gives us a date, to what is called the merits of the case. Comrade Anva would be explaining this much better than I. The merits would go into the key issues of whether there is indeed a genocide. And it's clear, if I deny you food, if I deny you water, if I deny you energy, my intention is to kill you. If I tell you move to point B, and as you move I kill you, my intention is to wipe you out. If you move to point B, then I tell you back to point A and I kill you as you move, my intention is genocide. So for the African National Congress, this is a clear issue of an abuse of human rights, and it's something that we cannot accept or tolerate. And as the African National Congress and this government, we are resolute that we will continue to pursue this case. And of course, if you, as the people of South Africa, do something very odd, like not ensuring the ANC as a majority, we as the ANC, we're going to pursue the case, but the government won't. So make sure, make sure you vote. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we all a lot more clear on how the process is going to work. I'm going to break a little bit with protocol. I'm going to come to you in a moment, uh, Premier. But I actually want to link something that's very important in terms of the discussion around the ICJ and solidarity and international solidarity. But I'm going to pick up, uh, Minister, from something you've just said. And I'm going to put you in a tough uh, spot here, Uncle Nazim, or Comrade Nazim. I was told to, not Uncle, I was told not to do that, sorry. Um, but what? yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to know some of your thoughts about this upcoming election, in addition to this international solidarity. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I'd be very interested to hear some of your thinking on this upcoming election. And for those who may not be able to see uh, Comrade Nazim, maybe just come a little forward yourself as well, Premier. I'm a little worried that maybe those at the back may not see your face. Premier as well, if you can come forward. Over, over to you, not uncle, Comrade Nazim. Oh. I, I think Fasia is, is worried that time is out, so she wants to jump into other issues. Um, I firstly, Minister, uh, Premier, Comrade the efforts of our government in international justice is highly commended, and you've heard that from everyone. I've just got a note now that our government is seeking additional provisional measures at the ICJ. And, and we understand that this is because of the horrors that we are witnessing every day. I must be honest, as the Palestine Solidarity Alliance in particular, but in the solidarity movement in general, we didn't hold much hope for this ICJ thing. <laughs> we thought we're going to another United Nations resolution, veto, and so forth. We Nevertheless, uh, saw it as a positive move and we encouraged it. I know from our side we had a live panel monitoring it with advocate Aslam Bawa and a few other legal people and it was really interesting and the take from a legal point of view and there was huge interest. I think at one point we had like seven or 8,000 viewers on, on our channel at, for this. And so when the minister says that Israel's impunity was being exposed, the social media, the efforts of the solidarity movement and so forth clearly uh, indicates there was great interest and hope. We had already submitted to the ICC as the PSA two Gaza dockets. So after Kass led, um, we had submitted, but at the time, Palestine was not yet a recognized uh, state within the United Nations, even as, um, uh, as it is now. And, and, and we know that that status has to be where they are fully-fledged, recognized, independent state. That's the objective. 
So the ICC had rejected our, our cases. We, in 2021, had lodged the Al-Aqsa docket. This docket is placed at our NPA, the National Prosecuting Authority. And one of the things as we prepared for tonight was to bring to government the fact that the National Prosecuting Authority of our country is not serious when it comes to international justice. They are not acting and they are not moving. We have presented in the Gaza dockets and now again a list of South Africans serving in the Israeli Genocidal Defense Force. We want them to be prosecuted. <laughs> but what I want to say is that solidarity work is not easy work. It took us, and that's the PSA formed after the World Conference Against Racism in Durban. We formed a little organization. We did a few legal cases. We did lots of other work. We got to this point where there was movement, and we found this at the ICJ. We were thus very, very, very positively surprised when the ICJ gave the positive ruling of plausibility. And they did it with rugby scores. 14 to 2 and so forth. So political shifting requires our continuous effort. Coming to your question, Fasia. We are living in a country where there are mixed communities, mixed politics, and so forth. But what we are finding is that in 30 years, we have not changed the revolutionary culture to be that of all South Africans. The culture that we grew up with in our struggle for justice, for equality, for freedom, and most importantly, the culture of anti-racism has not permeated within our society. I think that if we had taken those values, values that gave character to the people that have led our movement, we would have not seen the kind of uh, support that certain political parties give for Israel. We would not see the hypocrisy of a certain Stianazen flying to Ukraine, but not flying to Gaza. So, so the, the fact that if it is someone of fair skin that is suffering, that you should feel more. But when it's someone who is of a darker skin and they are suffering, they deserve it. Is a racist value system that still permeates much of our society. And we need to challenge that racism. I think that for me was the greatest victory of the ICJ and the work that we did here is to say that the statement of Nelson Mandela that South Africa cannot be truly free until Palestine free is free is now far more relevant because it has opened the minds and the hearts and the souls of South Africans to what freedom really means, what justice really means. And Palestine has awakened the world to see what is the difference between justice and injustice. They have stirred the hornet's nest on October 7th and before that because the resistance didn't start on October 7th. We can talk about that a little later, because I think that is important. There is a sense, you know, I, we, we have a lot of Palestinians we've been supporting, uh, who have come back, um, who have been living in South Africa, um, and we ask, you know, I mean, what's your feelings about Hamas? You're seeing everyone is playing Hamas, why don't they release the hostages? Now there's this massacre and destruction. And every Palestinian's answer is the same. Hamas has given us our dignity. 
So while the West will spin a story and it's now exposed the New York Times for its lies, we know that on October 7th, which no one wants to talk about, is that three military bases were attacked. It was a military operation. One base. No one was supposed to know it exists. It's a military intelligence base. So the right to resistance, we in Lens know very well. We have been part of a struggle where we have had people from our community serve in Umkonto where Siswe. We even lost comrades, Yusuf and Prakash, my close comrades, who passed away while on an operation. We understand resistance and the right to resistance. And we applaud the resistance. And we must be clear, it is not only Hamas that's resisting. All the resistance organizations, from PFLP to Fatah to Islamic Jihad, are all, all standing in defense of Gaza. And when we ask ourselves, why? Why did Hamas attack? They had no other choice. They were living under a medieval siege for over 17 years where even the amount of calories per person was being rationed to enter Gaza. We know as the PSA, because we are part of the Freedom Flotilla Coalition, that when we attempted to break that siege, they attacked the Mavi Mamra, a humanitarian aid convoy. Let me just tell you that we are going to sail again this year. And we are going to sail with an international community and we are going to break the siege. We are going to break the siege. Because we, the atrocities and the inhumanity can no longer be allowed to continue. Masjid al-Aqsa, the Zionist Orthodox Jewish uh, fascists, as Ellen referred to them, were preparing to shut it to all the Muslims and take it to build their temple. If you look at the statements of Ben Gavir and others, that was on the cards. That's why we also already had the Al-Aqsa docket in 2021. So you've got a siege, you're hungry, Masjid al-Aqsa is under threat, and there was already intelligence information of the displacement and relocation of all of Gaza to the Sinai. So do you sit back? You resist. You have to. And that is the dignity that comes with standing for freedom, justice, and equality. Who do we vote for? We've debated this in the solidarity, but we are not here to campaign for any particular political party, except to say, you don't vote for those political parties who are narrow nationalistic, who are racist, who support Zionism unconditionally and give impu impunity. We do not vote, and I will say it, for the DA. But you also know that's not a new thing. We've always opposed the DA. You do not vote for the PA. You do not vote for the ACDP. And I don't even know those others because they're insignificant. When you vote, and we, I thought hard about this because we're all in the dilemma, right? Who do we vote for? Now you must understand my mother was an ANC counselor. I, <laughs> I was active in the movement. My brother was part of Umkonto. We come from the ANC, yet I was at a dilemma. And I realized that 
when it comes to election fever, there's a lot of emotion. But for this election, we have to vote conscientiously we in, in a rational and reasoned way, which you have to figure out for yourself. But I can tell you that certain political parties, should they get the upper hand in this country, they will take South Africa back 20 years. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Comrade Nazim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Firoza. Yeah, I'm uh, active in, in uh, media, worked with civil society. My name is Hassan Logat. Um, I've tried to fight uh, some of the newspapers, in particular Daily Maverick and The Citizen, on their reporting on both Cuba as well as, uh, well, they didn't publish my, my article, but the allegation, racist allegation, that uh, South Africans can't think for themselves. This uh, case was sponsored by Iran. I heard the minister's response, but I, I, I really want to know, so th my first question is, uh, some of these newspapers linked to the Race Relations Institute, the Brenters Foundation, have to be vigorously engaged. But I also have looked at your manifesto. Uh, it seems two parties the one by the former Youth League member and the other by the ANC, covers international issues. Are you going to call for an all-party debate on Palestine? If we can also just be brief for our questions. I know because I'm trying to get more people in. The more brief you are, the more voices we can hear. Thank you. Okay, good, good evening all. I'm, I'm a recently retired trade unionist and a beneficiary of international solidarity. I just want to ask, when are we going to stop trading with Israel? Assalamu alaikum everybody. Uh, I just, just on this good lady's comment, I just want to ma make a very brief comment. And I've uh, sent messages to some of the PSA members regarding this issue and addressing the people of Lanasia today. Uh, very saddenly, say that the people of Lanasia have forsaken the people of, not, not all the people, some of the people of Lanasia have forsaken the people of Gaza. If you go to all the super, super rich supermarkets, you find clover products full up. Where are we going to take clover out of Lanasia? When are we going to take the ZZ tomatoes out of Lanasia? Are we going to break our fast? The fast that we're going to keep fasting, or are we going to break those fasts with the blood of the people of Palestine? So the people of Lanasia, BDS, please, we need to start this campaign and get these shops. If we have to close the doors, let's close the doors. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, I want to say that today South Africa is writing horrible chapter of the history. Uh, on behalf of Palestinian people, leadership, thousands of martyrs, we thank uh, His Excellency President Sarah Ramaphosa, the brave Minister uh, uh, Nalidi Bandor, Minister uh, Lamola, uh, the soldier of... Uh, I am here to speak on behalf of Palestinian people all. I am a representative of the Palestinian people. Okay, we represent our people here. No, 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 Palestine. We represent Palestine. No. We, we thank Palestine. Amanla! Amanla! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Comrades. Lastly, lastly. Come, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
comrades, friends, we allow all voices. If you want to say something, we will give you a chance to say. Do not block someone from speaking while they are speaking. Thank you. Uh, lastly, we salute all the brave soldiers of South Africa who stood in the international court. We, all Palestinian people today, confirm that strong ANC and alliance is a strong South Africa, a strong South Africa is a strong Palestine and international solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's be cognizant of time because I want the minister to respond and I think we also want to hear a few more thoughts from the minister. We're very privileged to have it tonight. So I think one or two more questions and then I'd like to um, engage with minister. Yeah. My name is Yusuf Saluji. I was a former ANC councillor, 1995 to 2000 in Indonesia. The question I, I wish to pose and ask is, firstly, firstly, genociders, countries that support genociders cannot be in the United Nations Security Council. They have to be ousted. The question I am very hurt about is that the present United Nations, as it is constituted, is not just. It's not rendering out peace to the world at all. I want your comment on that. And how do we change the United Nations? That is the first question. The second one I'm asking is this. We've sent 2,000 troops to Congo to pr promote peace there. Can we get international troops to go to assist the people of Palestine? It is a thing that is directly and urgently needed. Thank you. All right, let's take the last question. I really want to hear from the minister and the team. Okay. Okay, we've got one last question from the media. I think that's a lot. we've just got one more question for the media, and I'm going to give this comrade one, and then. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll be brief. It's concerning betrayal. Many countries were complicit in complacent, including those which stood with Palestine. On the other hand, South Africa has the courage to take the matter to the ICG. Did the South African government consider the existential threat posed by those supporting Israel? What is your opinion with regards to those who support the genocide in the Gaza locally, internationally, including South African citizens participating in the genocidal war? Thank you. Let's take that very last one, one please. Last one. I want us to get enough time for response as well. Murat Özgür Güven, the Anadolu Agency, Turkish Media. Uh, my question is, are you satisfied with the implementation of ICG decisions? And does Israel implement ICG decisions already? And how do you evaluate the deployment of international forces to ensure a ceasefire in Palestine? All right, thank you very much. Let's start with the minister. Um, All right, thank you very much uh, for, for the questions. I just want to say that uh, it's always important to listen to each other. It's a, a, a skill and an important courtesy, particularly to strangers, because part of what we are trying to do as South Africans is both to show the practice of democracy, but also the embrace of all. And we don't have the perfect answers as South Africa. We've made many mistakes. All of us, not just the government. I know it's nice to beat up the government. But we are all South Africans. And not all of us are perfect. So I, I do really want us to appreciate the need to really ensure that everybody, whether we agree with each other or not, they are welcome, and we are ready to have a discussion with them. I, I would like to uh, begin, uh, if you'll allow, uh, with the comments Molana Suleiman Rawat made. 
Uh, I don't know if Mulana is still here. He's gone, or maybe you'll share it with him. Mulana is right. Not all that we wanted to achieve as a new democracy has been achieved in the 30 years. But a great deal of the legacy we've inherited has been addressed. And I think it is improbable to imagine that in 30 years, we would come overcome all the legacy of apartheid. I don't think it's possible. There's no nation which experienced the level of oppression, harm, and racism that could ever address all social and economic ills in 30 years. It's just impossible. And so I do think it's important that we always look at the record of what has been done. Yes, indeed, point out the imperfections. And yes, I agree with Molana Rawat, call on government and any party that is in power that it must fight and eradicate corruption. But I challenge the notion that everybody in the ANC is corrupt. I'm not corrupt, I've got integrity. No, I'm not corrupt. And I refuse to be labeled because I belong to the African National Congress. I could keep you here all night and tell you the positive things I've done in the different portfolios I've held. And I've never stolen one penny of public money. I also want to say to you, and particularly to my comrade, Hassan Logat, I've been looking for you, wondering where you are. I'm so glad to see you are here. And I thank you for the challenge to the media. One of the things I've been communicating on the question of the unjust cruelty practice against Palestinian people is in 2021, when we had COVID, one journalist broke the lockdown rules and ran into a group of police who arrested him correctly for breaking the law and kept him in a cell overnight. I got 202 letters from different press organizations, individual media. Over 100 journalists in Palestine have been killed. There's silence, <laughs> silence. So I think it's important what you're doing to challenge the false reporting in the media. When we took the case to the ICJ, the Financial Mail had a, co a, a column which said the Pando problem and that I don't know foreign policy. All sorts of insults were leveled against me by the very paper you've referred to which many people thought was a radical new introduction of media. But actually, it's become a mouthpiece of certain organizations and, and individuals. And we know that those that support them are busy with a regime change agenda to conservative governments and anti-liberation movements in Africa. So we must continue the challenge. We have had many debates in Parliament, even today, I was in the portfolio committee answering these very questions. Iran has funded you, and I'm called the legal arm of Hamas by my Prime Minister Netanyahu. <laughs> We've had these debates, but the problem we have, which I think uh, Comrade Adam spoke to so brilliantly, we don't regard each other as full human beings. Some people are human beings and others are not. For example, the injustice in Palestine is believed to have begun on October 8. It's seven decades, seven decades. So people know the facts, but in order to continue their racist notion, they will never admit it. I've 
even, I think I've lost friends among foreign ministers because they say, don't you respect sovereign territory? So I said, do you respect the right of the Palestinian people to their land? And they say, we're talking about Ukraine. So I say, why is Palestine different? We've had the debates. And we, we will continue to have the debates. The latest, they're asking what the lawyers are costing government. And they say, I'm, I'm, um, my master is Iran, and Iran is paying because I visited Iran as an envoy <clears throat> of the president. Of course, nobody's my master. Partial master might be Sharif, my husband, but that's, you know, <laughs> that's me and him. Iran, we are friends with Iran. It's, they're a friend of South Africa, a partner. <laughs> On the matter of uh, the trading with Israel, well, I think I must turn the question to you. When will you stop buying Israeli-made goods? I, I, I think it's important that you never make the assumption that a government can be an activist fully. It can do courageous things, as our government has done, but it cannot go the whole hog. The whole hog is done by civil society. Don't forget that. Don't forget that in the struggle against apartheid, we had pillars, international solidarity, armed struggle, mass mobilization. And underground. Four pillars of struggle. Are we using mass mobilization sufficiently? When I spoke at Al Quds in uh, Cape Town, I said to my brothers and sisters, why are you not picketing every day outside these embassies? The five main supporters of Israel, just 10 people would stop the genocide. Like those black sesh women, do you remember? They were always on the street corner. Stop apartheid. Imagine if every day we had a rotation and 10 of us with posters were always outside these embassies. We know giving arms. We know supports Israel. Why are we not out there? It's good, you know, it's very good to be a revolutionary. I'm always being shouted at as a minister. I'm used to it. People shout. Ministers this, ANC that. Minister. You don't know the contribution that we're trying to make. I am living and breathing Palestine at the moment. <laughs> and so what we need... We need the activism to stand up. We need mass mobilization. I'm not only speaking to you as a community that has a large proportion of the Muslim community. I'm speaking to Christian believers as well because they have a, an association of the Bible with the people of Israel. And I'm explaining to them the great books and the people of the book and why there is, at the moment, a struggle by the people of Palestine. You need to persuade, to educate, to change minds. You can't force belief. People must freely understand and it must be their hearts which appreciate that we cannot tolerate what is being done to the people of Palestine. We must turn hearts. So don't only speak among yourselves as Muslims. Go out there, engage others. 
Because people who are leaders are saying, Naledi Pando is against Christians. She's a Muslim. That's why she's taking this up. She hates people of the Bible. Absolute lie. But it's the only argument they have, a falsity, to proceed with their support of impunity against a people. And we, I will stand up everywhere. You've seen me speak to the most powerful foreign ministers. And I've said before them, I said yesterday, we need to get aid into Palestine. I know how we can do it. All the countries, which are powerful countries with big armies, that are giving arms to Israel, they must send their soldiers to the Rafah border to escort the 700 trucks of aid into Gaza. <laughs> that matter is on the BBC now, and they probably think I'm a mad woman, but I'll keep saying it. The lady said to me, Minister, surely you can't expect that to happen. So I said, if the world has a conscience, that's what must happen. It must be them who ensure we don't have dead skeletons on the street of Gaza because people are starving. And she said, will Israel allow it? And I said, will Israel shoot their biggest supporters? It's only them. The supporters of Israel have a big responsibility to address the needs of the people of Gaza. And that's what we should be saying more and more and more. Finally, it's not true to say that the Palestinian uh, Authority has sold out. I think there have been a lot of faults in them. I have said in many audiences. There were many people when we were approaching a negotiations process who tried to tell us what we should negotiate and who we should negotiate with. And we told them we as the liberation movements want to speak for ourselves. We have our own ideas. So I have said all over the world when they asked me, should it be this group or that? I said, prize number one. Prize number one, the people of Palestine must decide who they want to lead them. Number two, all the factions in Palestine must sit down and talk. Because when you're united, you're a power, you're a force. If you are divided into factions, you are useless. And the issues of failures, of administration, of funding, management, of the public service, those must be addressed. But I cannot agree, having worked with Minister Maliki, for example, and been with him in very difficult situations, I will not accept any allegation that he's a sellout. He isn't. He isn't. Indeed, the United Nations must change. We've been arguing for UN reform for years. The UN is not representative, it's not effective. We can see this today. One of the issues I believe we must address in the reform agenda is the composition of the UN Security Council to include Africa and other parts of the developing world. Asia is not represented properly there. I also believe that given the propensity of man for evil and conflict, we must have peace enforcement capacity in the United Nations. We can't rely on a debate in the Security Council. We can't rely on the P5. <clears throat> They've shown that they cannot maintain peace and security. So I think the United Nations needs to move beyond peace monitoring and have a capacity for peace enforcement. If they had it, that peace enforcement capacity would be on the ground in Palestine saving lives today. But we don't have it. 
and I think we should. I also think that we must ensure that this matter of the veto is reversed and we have a proper democratic way of making decisions in the United Nations. But as South Africa, we've argued that the UN should move to text-based discussions on reform. The powerful countries don't want it because they enjoy amazing hegemony at the moment. But we are pushing for it in the United Nations and we would enjoy your support in that regard. <clears throat> On the matter of the DRC, it is vital that we have the SADC mission to the DRC because you know what happens when one of our countries on the continent breaks up due to instability and violence, we'll have a large number of illegal immigrants spread all over the world and it doesn't do Africa well. So we've got to bring peace and stability to the DRC. And this is part of the significant African mandate that South Africa holds as its foreign policy. So I think government has taken the right step in this regard. <clears throat> Am I satisfied with the ICJ decision? I had said publicly on that day of the decision, I'm not totally satisfied because I wanted all our provisional measures to be agreed upon. But the majority were, and you can't have everything you want. And the fact that the ICJ has spoken positively in our case, this is a big win for South Africa, for those who support humanity, and for the people of Palestine. Palestinian people have said to me, you made us visible to the world. You have made us whole, South Africa. And I thank all of you for that. I've tried. Premier, anything from you? Just, I know it's late, but we're just gonna close up. Anything there? Um, yeah, they, a few things. Firstly, obviously, Clover and PSA has led this boycott, but it also links to our ongoing activism to, pr to push for uh, an end to these uh, multinationals who come into our country, invest, but have ulterior motives. We know that Milko and the Israeli bottling company was behind the buyout of Clover, South African brand. Uh, we maybe need to look and, act, and, and work our activism and lobbying to change some of that legislation. But like the minister said, that the buying power is in our hands and we have to promote the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign. Down the road here, if you turn left, there's a little fruit and veg shop called Bismillah's. Uh, 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 I forget the name, Suhail and his brother-in-law, they run the shop. And since the very first call, they've never kept clover in their, in, in their, in their little shop. This is the activism that we want, but you're right, we will go to those stores that are keeping Clover. Some of them, we have approached them and they've told us they're going to sell out what they have and they're no longer going to store it. These are business people, we have to engage them and we want alternatives in our communities. We must make lens an apartheid-free zone. So I agree with you on that. I, the minister has spoken. Uh, sorry guys, the floor is closed for Q&A. It's, uh, uh, hello, can you guys sort this out for me, please? Okay. Uh, oh, guys, I'm speaking. All right. So, we don't all agree on everything. And I think the minister today and uh, Comrade Panyaza, you guys are like convincing us. Uh, but that was your purpose. Uh, I just want to say there are two young girls here with us in the audience who were part of the eva evacuation from Gaza. They are very shy. So Safa and Marwa, are you with us? Safa and Marwa, I know you are very shy. <laughs> there are two young Palestinians who managed to come out of Gaza. There's still a lot of work and support that they need. We know they have not come with any papers, documents, and it's a difficulty to get into university, so we will be calling for some help. 
uh, so that they can get on and move on. They are young, energetic. We know that Angela is with us, and we are with you and supporting you. I know your family, your husband is back in Gaza. I also know that Khalid, we have difficulty sorting out your children's paperwork. Uh, but as long as some of us are there, they will get an education. Uh, so we will ensure that they are in our schools and that they have every opportunity because those are the values that our democracy fought for our, and this government of the African national fought for. We must appreciate those uh, uh, human values. So with that, I want to go on to the final part. Can I lead this one, Fasiha? So we have a few gifts. You know, when you come to Lens, there's a lots of gifts. Uh, I understand, and I want to just welcome Ahmad Jamal from the Egyptian community. They, and we know that a number of Islamic Brotherhood people were sentenced to death today. It's still a story in Egypt. But the community does a lot of community work in South Africa, and they want to present this certificate from the Egyptian South African community to Minister Naledi Pando. The same message, the same message of hope and dignity from the Arab community in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Amanda! Long live Palestine! Long live! Uh, comrades, thank you for this invitation. For the past five months, we have witnessed a terrible calamity. We have witnessed catastrophe for the people of Palestine. We have seen genocide in front of us, genocide in real time. And we see that the world has largely been silent. We see that the United States, NATO, and other powers who support Zionist Israel have not flinched from sending arms, sending material support, and of course political support, where at the United Nations they have vetoed every attempt to stop the slaughter. Until we saw the South African government finally take action, and we salute our government. Long live the action against the ICJ. It has taken us many years, comrades, as activists in Palestinian solidarity since the very first Gaza Wars in 2008. We have struggled to reach our government and appeal for a stronger voice and action, particularly with BDS, boycott, disinvestment, and sanctions to look at nonviolent ways of putting pressure on Zionist Israel. We've also tried to isolate the Zionist movement in South Africa to see that the government, <laughs> to see that our government stops the flow of money to Zionist Israel, stops the flow of Jewish citizens of South Africa who go to fight in Israel, and to stop the Zionist propaganda which is being put out in the Jewish educational system. <laughs> Finally, we must say, the chief rabbi of South Africa, Warren Goldstein, represents the South African Orthodox Jewish community. And his voice, sadly, is the voice of rabbis who stand for fascism. And I do not say that lightly. The Israeli government today is not just supported but directed 
by religious nationalists, and Warren Goldstein follows that line. And he has come out to slander the South African government and our minister. And we must take a very firm stand to stop the abuse of religion as a weapon for ethnic cleansing and genocide. Let, let me also say, comrades, we must be very honest. Palestinians are standing alone against military and political force that, that seems to be invincible. And we must also say the Arab world, the frontline states of the Arab world, have been silent. We must also note that the Palestinian Authority has become a Bantustan supporting the Israeli security apparatus. <laughs> Comrades, we must be honest because otherwise, the day after the guns finally seem to fall silent, the political struggle for the advancement of Palestinian liberation will have hardly begun. We urge our government, we know that steps were taken in the past, to bring together the Palestinian parties, to resurrect the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, to represent the entire Palestinian people, not simply balkanized in Gaza, or in the West Bank, or in Lebanon, or in Syria, or in Jordan. Our government now has credibility as never before through this action. You have raised our spirits, you have given us a direction. Now is the time for South Africa to take this political advantage forward. We represent the hope for Palestine. We may say apartheid. We may say that apartheid South Africa was defeated, but we know still today the struggle in our own country continues. And so with Palestine. Finally, comrades, we appeal to the minister to set up an advisory structure where we as solidarity groups through the South African BDS coalition can meet regularly with government to put our positions and together strategize so that we can advance freedom in Palestine and in other countries, our neighboring countries, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, Mozambique, we know the difficulties of Southern Africa. All these struggles are connected. So finally, comrades, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Amanda. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about. African politics, economy, and increasing power. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned. Tell us what you think in the comment section. Like and share the video, and subscribe so that you don't miss any of our African videos. It's the best way to support us.